Chapter Eleven of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Eleven, Discords. Walter Bramber left Coombe Cellars greatly discouraged. He had unintentionally ruffled the plumes of the churchwarden by disputing his knowledge of the situation of Waterloo, and mainly by discovering that his affairs were in something worse than confusion that they wore a complexion which indicated the approach of bankruptcy. And Pasco Pepperill was one of the magnates of the village, and full of consciousness that he was a great man. Bramber walked into the little village shop belonging to Whiteaway, the second church warden, who was also on the committee of management and trustee for the school under the National Society. Here also his reception was not cordial. It was intimated to him that his presence in the village and tenure at the mastership of the school would be tolerated only on condition that he supplied himself with groceries, draperies, boots, and lollipops from Whiteaway's shop. He walked to his lodgings. Such were the men with whom he was thrown. From two instances he generalized. They were to be gained through their interests. Unless he got one set of things at one store and another set at another, the two mighty men who ruled Coombe in Tynehead would turn their faces against him and make his residence in the place intolerable. As he walked slowly along the little street, he encountered a cluster of children, talking and romping together, composed of boys and girls of all ages. Directly they saw him, they became silent, and stood with eyes and mouths open, contemplating him. Bramber heard one boy whisper to the next, "'That's the new teacher. Ain't he a duffer?' He nodded and addressed a few kindly words to the children. He expressed his hope that they would soon be well acquainted and become fast friends, to which no response was accorded. But no sooner was he passed than the whole crew burst into a loud guffaw which set the blood rushing into the young man's face. A moment later a stone was hurled and hit him on the back. He turned in anger and saw the whole pack disappear behind a cottage and down a side lane. He considered a moment whether to pursue and capture the offender, but believing that he would have great difficulty in discovering him, even if he caught the whole gang, he deemed it expedient to swallow the affront. On reaching his lodgings, Bramber unpacked his few goods, and as he did this, his heart ached for his Hampshire home. Old associations were connected with the trifles he took out of his box, linked with the irrevocable past, some sad, others sunny. Then he seated himself at his window and sank into a brown study. Young, generous, he had come to this nook of the West full of enthusiasm for his task, eager to advance education, to lift the children out of the slough of ignorance and prejudice in which their fathers and forefathers had been content to live, that his efforts would meet with ready and enthusiastic support, would be gratefully hailed by parents and children alike, by rich and by poor, he had not doubted. There is no darkness but ignorance, said the fool in Twelfth Night, and who would not rejoice to be himself lifted out of shadows into light, and to see his children advanced to a higher and better walk than had been possible for himself? But his hopes were suddenly and at once damped he was a fish out of water. A youth with a certain amount of culture, and with a mind thirsting after knowledge, he was pitchforked into a village where culture was not valued, where the only books seen were The Norwood Gypsy's Dream Book and The Forty Thieves, exposed in the grocer's window. He had been accustomed to associate with friends who had an interest in history, travels, politics, scenery, poetry, and art, and here in this backwater no one, so far as he could see, had interest in anything save what would fill his pocket or his paunch. Sad and temporarily discouraged, he took his violin and began to play. This instrument was to be to him an exile, companion, friend, and confidant. Presently he heard a male voice downstairs talking loudly to his landlady. He stayed his bow, and in another moment a stout and florid man stumbled up the staircase. "'How do ye, schoolmaster?' said this visitor, extending a big and moist hand. "'I'm Jonas Southcutt, landlord of the Lamb and Flag. 
As I was passing, I heard your fiddle squeak. You're just the chap us wants. Peter Adams, as played first fiddle at church, is dead. He was the man for you. He could turn you off a country dance, a hornpipe, or a reel. What, in church? No, not exactly that. At our little hops at the lamb and flag. And on Sunday, he was wonderful at an anthem or a psalm. We want someone who can take his place. You please to come and be sociable when the young folks want to dance. What can you play? Mall in the wad? The devil among the tailors? Oil of barley? Johnny, come tie my cravat? These were some of Peter Adams' tunes. And on Sunday, you should have heard him in Jackson's tea dum or at Christmas in While Shepherds Watched. It was something worth going to church for. I hardly know what to say, gasped Walter Bramber. I am newly arrived, and have not as yet shaken into my place. This is practice in night. The instruments will all be in my parlor this evening at half-past six. If you like to come and be sociable, and have a glass of spirits and water, and try your hand at Jackson's tea dum I reckon the orchestra will be uncommon gratified. You are very good, but... And when the practice is over, we'll whip in some young folks and have a dance, and if you'll fiddle some of them tunes, Maul in the Wad, or The Parson Among the Peas, or The Devil Among the Tailors, you'll get intimate with young and old alike. Then, also, you can keep your eyes open and pick out a clean, comely maiden and keep company with her and walk her out on Sundays, and so look to settling among us. You have a headwind and a strong tide against you. The old master was such a favorite, and so greatly respected, that I doubt, unless you make an effort, you won't go down here. This evening you must excuse me. I'm very tired. Well, this was kindly intended. I thought to put you on good terms with the parish at once. Perhaps you're shy of playing Jackson's tea dumb till you've tried it over privately. I'll see if I can borrow you the notes. Jackson's tea dumb. I presume you mean te deum. We always call it tea dumb here, and if you give it any other name, no one will understand you. We are English, not French or Chinese, in Comin Tinehead. The landlord of the Lamb and Frog descended the stairs, and Bramber, fearing lest he should have given offence, accompanied him to the street door. His landlady was a widow. When Jonas Southcutt was out of the house, she beckoned to Walter Bramber and said, "'I'll be main glad you ain't going to the practice tonight, for I've axed Jane Can into tea.' "'Who is Jane Can? "'Her teaches sewing and the infants in the national school. "'I thought you'd best become acquainted in a friendly way at the outset. "'She used to keep a dame's school herself,' and a very good school it was. But when the parson set up the new national school, he did not want exactly to offend folk and to take the bread out of Jane Can's mouth. You know she's akin to me and to several in the place, so he appointed her to the infants. Her's a nice respectable young woman, but her had a bit of misfortune as a child, falled and hurt her back, and so is rather crooked and short. Her may be a trifle older than you, but folk do say that it is always best so, for when a wife is young, God preserve us. You don't suppose I'm going to marry her because she's the sewing mistress. You might do worse. Folk are sure to talk anyhow, and it's best to give em some grounds for their talk. You see, she and you must walk together going to school and coming away, and she lives close by here. As I was saying, People say that when the wife is much younger than her husband, there comes a long family, and the man is old and past work when some of the youngest are still no better than babies. Bramber felt a chill down his spinal marrow, as though iced water were trickling there. I speak against my own interest, continued the widow, but it does seem a pity that you should not put your salaries together and occupy one house. She gets twenty pounds a year. If you was to marry her, you'd be twenty pounds the richer. "'Twas unfortunate, though, about that cricket ball. "'What about a cricket ball? "'Why, Jane Cam was looking on at a cricket match among the boys, "'and a ball came by accident and hit her on the side of the head, "'so that she's hard a hearing in her right ear. "'You'll please to sit by her on the left, 
and then she can hear well enough. Jane Can is my cousin, and I'd like to do her a good turn, and as she's maybe about seven years older than you, you need not fear a long family. Preserve me, gasped the schoolmaster. I'll set you a stool on her left side and give her a high chair, and then you'll be about on a level with her hearing ear. I... I'm going out to tea, said Bramber, snatching up his hat to fly the cottage, but was arrested at the door by a burly farmer who entered. This is Mr. Prowse of Wanacott, said the widow to Bramber, then to the farmer. This, sir, is the new teacher who is going to lodge with me. I've heard of him from Southcott, said Prowse. I've been told you play the fiddle. Perhaps you know also how to finger the piano. My girls, Susan and Eliza, are tremendously eager to learn the piano, and I thought that after school hours you might drop in at my little place, Wanacott, and give the young ladies lessons. I'd take it as a favor, and as I am a not inconsiderable subscriber to the national school, and... The widow, in a tone of admiration, threw in an aside to Bramber. He subscribes half a sovereign. The farmer inflated his chest, smiled, raised himself in his boots, and, thrusting his right hand into his pocket, rattled some money. He had heard the aside, as it was intended that he should. I may say, continued Mr. Prowse, that I am a bulwark and a buttress of the national school, and as such I lay claim to the services of the teacher, and if, after hours, he can hop over to my little place and give my girls an hour three times a week, then, he raised his chin and smiled down on the schoolmaster, then I shall not begrudge my subscription. It is true, said Bramber, that I can play a little on the piano, but... I am not sure that I am competent to give lessons. Moreover, I doubt if I shall have the time at my disposal. I am still young and must prosecute my studies. If you expect to remain here in comfort, said the farmer testily, you'll have to do what you are asked. You don't expect me to subscribe to the national school and get no advantage out of it. Thus it was. Some made demands on the time, some on the purse, and others desired to dispose of the person of the newcomer. To escape meeting the crooked sewing mistress, deaf of the right ear, Walter ran into the street and walked through the village. A laborer came up to him. "'I want a word with you, Mr. Schoolmeister,' said he. "'My boy goes to the national school, and I give you fair warning. If you touches him with your hand or a stick, I'll have the law of you.' "'But suppose he be disobedient, rude, or disorderly. My boy is not to be punished.' He is well enough if let alone. But do you send him to school to be let alone? I send him to school to be out of the way when my missus is washing or doing needlework. A little farther on his way, a woman arrested Walter Bramber and said, You be the new teacher, be you not? Please, I've five children in your school and three at home. Some of the scholars baint clean as they should be. I can't have my children come home bringing with them what they oughtn't, and never carry to school from my house. So, Willie, now, just see to em every day, as they be all right, afore you let em leave school, and I'll thank ye for it kindly. Presently a mason, returning from his work, saluted Bramber. Look here, schoolmeister. I want you to take special pains with my children, and get em on like blazes. If they don't seem to get forward in a week or two, I shall take them away and send them to Mr. Puttycomb, who is going to open a private school. Then another man came up, halted, and, catching hold of the lappet of Bramber's coat, said, My name is Tooker. I am not a churchman, but I have several children at your school. I won't have them taught the church catechism. I am a particular Baptist, and I won't have no children o' mine taught to say what their godfather and godmother promised and vowed for them, for they ain't had no godfathers nor godmothers, and ain't a-goin' to have none. You can't mistake my children. One has got a red head, another is yaller, and the third is sort of whitey brown, and has sunspots and a mole between the shoulder blades, and the boy never had no toenails. So mind, no catechism for them." And there is something, said again another, upon which I want to lay down what I think. 
I wish you to teach readin' and writin' in a rational manner. I hope to do that. Ah, but you've been too much at college and crammed with book larnin'. Why should you teach childer and fret their heads about the H when it's a thing of no concern whatsoever? Mr. Puttacombe, he was the reasonable man. Says he, raisin puddin' is good, and duffy puddin' without raisins is good. So it is with the English language. It's good all around, and the H's are just the raisins. You can put em in or leave em out as you pleases, and stick em in by the scores or just a sprinklin, and it's no odds. It's good always. Them's the principles of spelling I expect my little ones to larn at your school. And I hopes, Mr. Teacher, said another sententiously, as you'll never forget that it is not enough to teach the children reading, writing, and arithmetic. There is something more. There's a great deal more. Geography, history, the elements. There is something above all that, and you should make it the first thing, and reading and the rest after. What's that? Temperance. Teetotal principles. Bramber walked on. His discouragement was becoming greater at every moment. As he passed the lamb and flag, he was greeted by a hideous bray of instruments both stringed and brazen. This outburst was followed by a marvelous coruscation of instrumental music, races, leaps, a helter-skelter of fiddles, flutes, coronets, bass viol, now together, more often running ahead or falling behind each other, then one a piggyback on the rest. At the door of the public house stood Mr. Jonas Southcott with his face radiant. "'Well, Mr. Schoolmaster,' shouted he, "'what do you think of this? "'You've never heard such music before, I warrant. "'That is what I call music of the spears. "'It's Jackson's T-Dum.'" End of chapter 11